Welcome to the Change the Game podcast, where we are changing the game by doing business differently and highlighting stories of capitalism at its best. I'm Steve Baker with The Great Game of Business and co-author with Rich Armstrong of our new book, Get in the Game, How to Create Rapid Financial Results and Lasting Cultural Change. I am really excited about our special guest today, Royce George. Royce is an accomplished global business leader with a reputation for motivating teams from across industry segments and tearing down walls created by traditional command and control management styles and toxic work culture. This is going to be fun. Royce, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Steve. Pleasure and a privilege to be here. Well, I think it's our privilege. I got to say, when I heard about you, I couldn't believe your diverse background. I'm very interested to learn more. And and maybe we can share some of that with our listeners. I know you grew up in India and you're there right now talking to us from Bangalore. Uh, you started out as an engineer by training, but once you really started your journey into management, you literally and figuratively took flight. <laughs> so can you tell us about your background? Yes. Uh, like you said, Steve, I grew up in India, did my engineering in electronics. I worked for a few years in India and uh, when I came out of electronics, uh, that was a time when computers were just coming into India. So I wanted to be a hardware engineer. But my neighbor was a very senior person in the organization. He uh, said, Royce, you're more a people kind of guy. I, don't th I think you'll get tired putting nuts and bolts and motherboards together. So maybe you should look at sales business development. So rather reluctantly, I got into that. But I'm so glad I did. I had the privilege of working in two different industries, uh, primarily importing uh, electronic testing equipment. Those were the years when India didn't have too much of Forex. And so two major industries could super, you know, import equipment. One was the Defense and the Space Research Organization. So I worked with them. And then for a bit, I worked in the agricultural sector with tea and coffee industries, uh, importing stuff because they could export and they got money in. So, uh, that was my time in India. Then as a family, we moved to the Gulf, to Dubai, the United Arab Emirates. And I worked again in two startup companies. The first was for three years where I kind of felt my way around, you know, getting to understand the culture while doing work. Uh, the second one was, uh, a, I did a long stretch for 10 years where I joined a, a, an organization headed by a local who was also a diplomat, he had 20 other divisions. So I started the 21st and over a 10 year period, it really grew you know, uh, to 13 million. I enjoyed again, learning things about that place and culture. Then finally moved to Canada where I ended up being the head of a not-for-profit charitable organization that sent professionals from educational and medical backgrounds primarily to serve in Asia and the Arab world. So I traveled around seeing things and yeah, so my journey has been both informational and maybe in a sense, philosophical too. No, I love it. I mean, you've seen business from all different sides, plus through all these different cultures. So I want to ask about the cultural side, but first, um, the first thing I heard about you was that you talk about capitalism in context. Can mm -hmm. you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. You know, uh, I'm not a major in economics. As an engineer, my definition of capitalism is just two things, that it's free market and it's owning and managing private property. So within that definition, when I look at um, the business world, which, which uh, powers the economic system of a society, you know, most people would say there are different arenas that influence society, um, education, religion, media, arts, but the real power of society comes from the business world. That's the economic power. So when I look at uh, the way capitalism works, I look at it in India and I see one model uh, or one way of doing business. Then I come to the Arab world, I see a different way of doing business. I come to, I look at the Western world and I'm like, this is crazy. Uh, for example, let me just take salaries. In India, maybe those days, the ratio, the, the, the ratio between the highest paid and the lowest paid may be 10 to one. You move into the Gulf, it's 30, 40 to one. Wow. You come to the West and you're like, what's wrong here? 
the CEOs are paid in the stratosphere <laughs> while companies go bankrupt and people are laid off. I'm like, this makes no sense. Uh, so that bothered me and I wanted to see what does real capitalism mean? And you know, I knew if capitalism existed to benefit society, then there must be a basis for capitalism. So I looked back and interestingly, I found capitalism to be 3,500 years, years old. I repeat that, 3,500 years old. I only say that because my readings uh, say that capitalism started between 600 to 1,280 with the Arab okay. traders. But to me, it was when the nation of Israel moved from Egypt into, you know, into, their, from, into Canaan and they're asked to own and manage and run um, business, you know, whatever they own property for the benefit of the neighbor. So to me, um, true capitalism empowers society mm -hmm. and true capital capitalism benefits one's neighbor. In other words, if it benefits one's neighbor, it benefits the community, it benefits the society. If it doesn't do that, that's not true capitalism. I love it. Well, that fits right into, uh into Jack Stack's vision of capitalism because he sees there's a brighter side to capitalism, which is not just uh, make money and generate cash. Of course, that's the objective of any organization for profit or not for profit. You've got to fund the thing. And then, you know, he sees beyond it. He sees the people side, which is if we can teach everyone the secret, which in our case is, you know, those financials really are the secret language of business. And if we can empower people with that knowledge, he believes, and we do too, because uh, we live it every day teaching companies how to teach their people. We think that if people do better at work, they do better at home. And if they do better at home, they do better in their community. And that's proved out time and time again here at SRC. I know that uh, um, I think we have over 100 executives and managers that, that are board level directors at not-for-profits in our community alone. And that's amazing to me because uh, how else can you impact your corner of the world? That's the best way is to grassroots. I love it. I love it when you tie together for the benefit of your neighbor because it isn't just uh, the the few, the enrichment of the few, it's the enrichment of the many. And that makes for a much better uh, life. So um, with that in mind, let's talk about some of the different cultures that you've worked in. You mentioned India and the Gulf and uh, Canada. Um, and so you've got kind of east to west, really, in, in that whole gamut. Um, how, how does capitalism work and not work, if, I, if I'm saying that in a way that makes sense? I mean, there's, we've just established there's different kinds of capitalism or mm -hmm. different maybe levels, or there's a spectrum at least. So tell me best worst case that you've seen. Uh, to answer the first question, does capitalism work or not work? My answer is capitalism should and must work in any cultural context. If by definition, it exists to benefit and empower society mm -hmm. in the society. That being said, uh, I think one just needs to be sensitive to, to the context that one is in. So for example, it, it, Indians, well, I must say, India is not a homogeneous unit. We could actually call ourselves the United States of India. Mm -hmm. We are as diverse as you know, the United States in that sense. However, that being said, uh, primarily Indians are uh, you know, more the shy, the diffident, very respectful of the elders. And so you know, they, they, they're not aggressive. They may do aggressive, passive aggressive uh, you know, behavior at times. <laughs> But Don't we all? <laughs> generally, <laughs> you know, generally speaking, uh, that's how they work. So one needs to be sensitive to that in that context. When you come to the Arab, or at least my experience was in the United Arab Emirates, I mean, Dubai. Uh, and that's very interesting to see because in the United Arab Emirates, 20% of the population are the local population. 80% are migrant from all over the world. Wow. who come and run the businesses. So if you take the traditional Arab, is a very respectful, hospitable person. And uh, it's hilarious at times to know that when the Westerner comes in, and I use the deliberately, the Westerner comes in to meet with the Arab, uh, you know, the Arab will hospitably give him a drink, which is called a gava. 
and then he will begin to chat and he will ask questions like how are you and how's your family and how's your cattle and what news do you have about the US what do you think of the weather and, and all along the western is you know surreptitiously looking at the watch under the table saying when do I get the chance to do my 30 second elevation speech <laughs> right <laughs> So it's very interesting in that sense. When you come into the business world, most of the business is done by immigration, uh, immigrants from different parts of the world with one focus to make as much money they can before they get booted out of the country. So cultures will be as different as the number of businesses that exist and the gotcha. business leaders. The key, I think, is where in any culture, I think, Capitalism works depending on the leadership. Mm. Leadership will define the quality of that business or that capitalist right. venture. I, I get it. I agree. And I, I love how you put that in a context for me because it is, uh, it, it's very important for us to recognize those cultural differences. But when we get right down to it, you can have different cultures, but it's the culture we set in, as leaders that really makes all the difference. Um, so we think, speaking of leadership, we think that it can be taught. We, we believe that it should be taught. Um, some people say that people are just born leaders, and I don't disagree with it, but um, I really think that the stuff I've learned about leadership has definitely been taught and, and learned uh, in, in my case. What are some, some of the things that you see as core or key to, to teaching leadership and, and what makes it really work? Um, I completely agree with you that leaders are made, not born. All those born leaders uh, have chips on their shoulders and are difficult to, to be with at times. <laughs> I like the way John Maxwell uh, defined leadership. He said, a leader is one who has voluntarily, who has people voluntarily following him. What that means is people follow someone who they believe will take them to where he's promised that he will take them. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, in that sense, I think the, the, the character of the leader, uh, the credibility of the leader, the competence of the leader uh, are factors that are key to, to, to being a good leader. Credibility and uh, what was the other one? Uh, credibility would be part of character, but I would say character competence. Got it. I like to make notes because I like to sum up at the end what I've learned from uh, from our guests. Um, so when we think about these leaders, and, I, and thanks for reminding me of John Maxwell because he uh, he's definitely a guru of leadership. I, I totally agree. I think people uh, tend to follow someone who's inspiring rather than um, uh, you know, threatening or you know, on top of it. So oftentimes, I think Jack through the years has said, I hate being a boss, I don't like being a manager because nobody likes a boss. They do like to be led, they don't wanna be forced somewhere. And I think that our world definitely is in need of serious leadership, but that's not this program. So <laughs> we, I mean, the thing is, could we have someone inspire us all? That would be amazing, right? Um, when we talk about um, the principles and the practices of the great game of business, do you see them shaping or helping to shape the culture of an organization? Oh, absolutely. Uh, uh, I have no words to describe how I felt when I, when I read the book, Great Game of Business and the book, Get in the Game. Uh, while the first book knocked me off my chair a bit, the other one floored me after that. Uh, just amazing oh it it as i thought about it as i read about it i realized that not everybody not every business venture will be able to practice the great game of business and why do i say that simply because the key here is leadership and a value based process so if the owner or the business person is unable to buy in to being a servant leader or being humble, it's not going to work. Mm -hmm. And to me, uh, you 
I love the power of the GGOB in the sense that it, it, it separates, if I might use the word, the wheat from the chaff. Mm -hmm. I, I would agree with you. So could you elaborate on that a little bit when you, because you've seen it from all different sides, from um, a for-profit side, a not-for-profit side, but I, I know, well, maybe I shouldn't project my feelings onto you. Tell me what you've seen uh, in for-profit and not-for-profit, because um, I, I bet you've seen or tried to apply great game of business in both. Have you had successes on both sides? Um, well, I've learned a lot on both sides. Uh, what I've, in terms of for-profit and not-for-profit, the for-profit is very clear in its objective, at least one objective, bottom line. And so, you know, it gives at least focus and people can be aggressive. But in a not-for-profit, you, you don't have a true bottom line in that sense. You, you're based on the objective of the not-for-profit. You're trying to look at what is the impact that you have, uh, you have you know, carried out in society. And oftentimes, that is a, a difficult measuring process. Uh, and so the, what you see is that in the, in the not-for-profit world, they're not as aggressive as the for-profit world. They're much more laid back, more sensitive. Uh, the what I think every business leader who thinks he's a leader and, and, and doesn't know he has a chip on his shoulder needs to go and work in a not for profit. Ah, true leadership in a not for profit is very humbling. Very that humbling. is a great takeaway right there. Every leader. Um, should work at some point at a not-for-profit. That's interesting, Royce, because I've uh, told all of my three kids that the one thing they need to do uh, is work at a uh, factory. Uh, they need to do it for a summer or something as they're going to school. They just need to know that um, wh what that feels like um, mm -hmm. and, and then want to do more. And there's nothing wrong. We have 2,000 people in our factories here and we're trying to build leaders all the time, but it's not about the factory work. It's about becoming the best version of yourself. And so that was my stupid way of trying to teach my kids that, hey, I, I want you to want more, but you got to know what this feels like, right? And um, through the years, I mean, I've seen a lot of different examples, but I think you're right. I think a leader should really understand, a good leader should understand all levels of an organization. And in this case, by putting them into a not-for-profit mode, they get to see what it's like to be mission driven instead of just objective driven. And that's a big difference. Yes. So let's talk about that a little bit. Have you been able to, through the years in different organizations, have you been able to tie mission and objective together so that people followed you, Royce? Hmm. I, 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 I looked, have looked at how to, it, I go back, I believe in people. I believe that the value of an organization is in people. So I've always worked to empower the people I work with. So, uh, you know, when I set up that whole business uh, unit in, in Dubai, for example, if I take a for-profit example, yes. I, having worked with them 10 years, built it. On the day prior to flying out of Canada, uh, flying out to Canada, Mm -hmm. the first tech I hired came over to say bye to me. And as he was leaving, he's a six foot huge guy. Uh, he just prostrated on the floor before me and my wife jumped up wondering, what was that all about? So I told her, that's okay. So I held his hand, pulled him up and he had tears in his eyes as he walked out. And I said, that's his way of saying, I respect you. I appreciate that you. Is, wow, that must've been powerful to experience. Oh. I still remember that scene. Wow. May I ask what culture he came from? Because to prostrate, prostate oneself is very, it's Indian. a big move. Yes. It is a very Indian act of respect for an elder. You gotcha. normally do that if you, you know, come into the presence of an elder, but you wouldn't do that in the business setup. You wouldn't do that. In so that was his way of saying, you changed my life. Well, that's what it's all about is changing lives, Absolutely. right? 
Absolutely. So, you know, we have been working on that for years. I've been here for 15 years. Rich has been here for 30. Um, and, and it is pretty amazing to be able to be able to say that we're, we're making things. So we're the economic engine uh, or we're part of the bigger economic engine of society, but we're also teaching them something that the schools and the families are not, which is about how money works and how you can uh, better yourself in society and improve not only your family's lives, but your community. Um, that is pretty fulfilling, I've got to say. And I sense that you have also had a very fulfilling career professionally and on the side of uh, changing lives. Can you talk a little bit about more of those stories like you just mentioned? Uh, what? Hey, you, I'll give you here, a let, me, let me rephrase that, Royce. Please share with us some more and know that we aren't going to take it as anything but a humble guy who doesn't want to talk about it being forced to talk about it by a podcaster. <laughs> uh, I'll give you another example. You know, when we were doing this business, we were in the construction industry doing uh, what we call extra low voltage projects. We got a major order close to 2 million. And uh, the challenge in, in, in the United Arab Emirates is that you, they, I always say, why is it that they put out the tender at 10 p.m.? expect you to close it at 10.30, and then they want you to finish the work at 11 o'clock when they, they had all this time. But that's how it works. So we had this tender which had a huge liability clause. And when, you know, amongst the other projects, we had to execute this at speed. So, and I knew I didn't have enough manpower resources. So I told my tech guys, I said, go out and pick up laborers from the, from the you know, standing on the streets and just finish it. Otherwise we get hit with this liability. So we finished the project on time, or rather ahead of time, and we had picked quite a few, and we found three of them really good. So I kept them in another project. Anyway, the end of the year, we had a great bonus, and uh, I had to send the bonus worksheet based on the formulas used to the corporate office. Mm -hmm. So I sent the bonus sheets to the corporate office, and... Uh, the man, the, the financial controller from the corporate office called me and says, I see three names here who are not on the employee payroll. I said, that's right. They're people I picked up from the street. He says, company policy does not allow us to pay bonuses to non-employees. So I said, yes, I know the policy, but I have just this to say that if those three had not worked their butts off into earning a bonus, I'd be paying a liability clause. And I want you to know that the book that I read says very clearly, do not muscle the oxen that threshes the corn. And that's the principle of why I want to pay them. I won the battle. That's fantastic, especially with a large company that has very strict policies. That is wonderful. So when you, uh, I, I assume that those folks were really surprised by that bonus and very thankful. Oh, yes. That's awesome. We hear a lot of stories like that, Royce. It's just powerful to, to think about uh, leaders that, that really value their people. As you've said, they're the real true value of an organization anyway. Right now, we know that there's a war for talent. Uh, you cannot get enough people. We have over 100 openings here at SRC and every single client that we have tells us the same story. You know, How do I become the employer of choice? How do I find people? Any thoughts for our audience? I want the leaders to know that if in every human heart, three things they seek, they seek security, they seek success, and they also seek significance. And all the three matter. Uh, and I think as a leader, you need to be a man of who they can trust because trust is dynamic. You could be trustworthy to last today, do something foolish today and drop your trust. You need to have a servant leader heart and you really need to think through what Stephen Covey said. Mm -hmm. He said, you know, you need to learn to live, to love, and to leave, leave behind a legacy. Mm -hmm. And I think one needs to take time to think through those things. That's very good. And the question is, what is your legacy? Yeah. And that's significance. That, that is, uh, as I said, such the part of fulfillment 
that people often think money will bring. And in fact, it is quite the opposite. Um, so that brings me to my questions about uh, your not-for-profit side. Um, you've been involved in not-for-profits through the years, but tell me a little bit about that journey, if you would, the kind of the what and the why. I must say that when I, it is probably providential that I moved into not-for-profit because I was in a new country and in a new world in that sense, but not in an industry that I was, that I knew before. So initially it was very confusing, but you know, as I, as I uh, traveled around watching the work people did, it helped me to ask fundamental questions about earlier, my trajectory was based on the earlier two books I'd read, you know, way back in the 90s, 1980s, I'd read the book In Search of Excellence. Mm -hmm. Peters. Tom Peters, yeah. And, and that kind of launched me into, I need to see what excellence is all within the concept of the business world. But when I started to move into the not-for-profit world uh, and saw, you know, and especially they were focused on the the fringes of society, the, the, those who were marginalized, how do we lift them up? And as I, you know, worked in that field, the question that came back to me was that if, if economy is what powers a society, uh, what business model will, will work in an urban center that will power society? And in a sense, I think my search for, uh, for finding what I call the wineskin of business. I use the word wineskin of business because in my, you know, I struggled with, I struggled with, I knew business metrics existed. Mm -hmm. I knew, you know, Patrick Lencioni and all the others uh, uh, talk about culture and how culture, and I'm like, God, is there a way this too can work? Mm -hmm. And so when I, you know, so that set me reading uh, as I'm working in the not-for-profit world. And so when I finally found these two books, I just fell off my chair, I'll be honest. Well, you're, you're very flattering. I, you got to explain wineskin to me. Oh, what I struck, what I, you know, what I struggled with was, is there, in a sense, when you look to measure metrics, you are looking to, you know, there was a process of measuring metrics. And then they tried to teach you culture and, and core values. Uh, and often they, you know, as everybody would say, culture flows way down. And my experience was that while a lot of leaders, you know, bought into culture and core values, culture by the time it flowed all the way down, it was either diluted, diluted, or uh, it, it, you know, it didn't reach down there, it was depleted. So I was looking for, I said, is there a way or a process where if you have to put this process into play, it needs to have core values built into the process. Mm -hmm. I, and, and I'll be honest, I thought it didn't exist for a long time. I I was, you know, I'm like, to the point, you know, when I spoke with Darren, I said, Darren, where were you guys? I've been searching for years. Where were you guys? <laughs> That's the question Jack Stack wakes up in a cold sweat every night at midnight. I think is <laughs> why doesn't everybody know about this? Yeah, it's a good so question, Royce, and we're working on it, man. Let me tell you. So tell me, uh, define for me the wine skin, because I'm trying to I'm trying to put that into that analogy into my brain. Okay. You see, uh, why did I say wineskin? Because, you know, there's a statement that new wine needs a new wineskin. Ah. And I'm like, is there a methodology that, that depicts true capitalism? Is there a business venture that can actually showcase true capitalism by definition of being a blessing and a benefiter to society. And so to me, that if that was what one was looking for, considering that capitalism seemed to be all over the map, what did this true capitalism look like? What, what were the processes? So what did it require? What, what leadership did it require? So what are the different ingredients 
that held this thing together. Mm -hmm. you know? gotcha. So, and and I, I'm, I'm just so overwhelmed with what I found it in the great game of business. Now, yeah, Royce, well said. And thanks for being patient with me. So I'm going to repeat it back. That's how I learn. Um, if I remember correctly, in the old texts, it was, uh, you know, don't put new wine in an old wine skin for it will burst and that sort of thing. So you're saying the new idea of business, kind of its money, its people, its both needed a new structure. The wine skin is the, the great game holding those things together where there's values and capitalism together. Thanks for that explanation and the analogy. I've officially mm -hmm. just co-opted it and stolen it from you. So I'll be using that a lot. <laughs> You are most welcome. And I can give you, I was sitting and thinking, how would I define the great game of business? And so here's my definition. Uh, an explosive fusion of clear bottom line metrics and great top of the line culture components resulting in empowered employees and sustainable, successful businesses. Mm. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. So let's talk about that for a second. How do we take that wonderful definition that you've just laid out for us? And how do we help global businesses engage and empower their employees more? I firmly believe in monkey see, monkey do. Uh, and I think I'd love to see great game of business labs in major countries in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, how do we get there? Maybe another day's story, but I believe we will get there. I believe you will get there because as people hear about the great game of business and buy-in, they, they would want to see, hey, why can't I do that too? Why can't I leave behind a legacy that, that many will talk about. Yeah, I love it. Love that vision. So tell me what is happening with you next, Royce. What's next on your uh, agenda of awesomeness? Ah. You know, I've been on a search uh, for finding the wineskin of true capitalism. Having found it, what I'd love to do, my legacy, as I would like to see it, is to ask people, which I've already started doing, uh, friends who are business people here or with business connections, uh, I want to ask them, have you ever heard of ownership thinking? Do you know what that means mm -hmm. and how it works? Uh, and so just, just to get the people to, and really I was talking to a guy who was a big headhunter in India, placing different companies, and he hadn't heard about ownership thinking. I'm like, yeah, I got my job cut out. I'm going to enjoy this. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, it'll be great to have you on the, uh, uh, the, the big Great Game of Business community worldwide helping to spread the word. Um, so, you know, the last question that we always ask guests on the podcast is, uh, what is the question we should be asking you, Royce? Um. How did you feel when you found the great game of business? <laughs> okay. How did you feel when you found the great game of business? I had no words. I was overwhelmed. I thought that wineskin did not exist. <sighs> it does. That's and awesome. I'm so glad I found it. I am too, man. Well, you are an inspiring uh, guest and friend of the game. We sure appreciate you. And I look forward to talking with you again. Um, what, uh, what do you think that, you know, if folks wanted to reach out to you, how would they reach you, Royce? Folks can reach me at royce.george at gmail.com. Perfect. Well, Royce George, thank you so much for being with us. It's a huge pleasure and, uh, and uh, just really enjoyed speaking with you. Um, let's keep the conversation going. Send us your questions, your stories, your best practices, ideas, challenges, and of course, your victories, because that is capitalism at its best. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time.